I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about what actually we are doing here every Wednesday afternoon after school when your children are probably already tired and still come here to do some more maths. I find that our approach is different in three different ways. Well, first is that our tasks, the tasks we set up for children, they, um, they, m they mean to highlight the most important ideas in mathematics. So every task is justified from a mathematical point of view. There is always a reason behind the task. We know why we set it, because there is some deep connection between other topics or between what they learned previously. So let me give you an example. So let's say we have a very common um, school type question. What is 17 times 13? Well, this is just the fact. We need to find out what's, what's the answer is. Well, the answer is 221. And it, it's not really important. What I find is what is important is how this fact is related to other facts. For example, if we know that already, can we work out what 17 times 14 is? What is it? How is it linked with the, this one? Or what is it 18 times 13? Or maybe what is 18 times 26? So it's the links between different facts, not the facts themselves that can be learned and forgotten that are important. So as, as you probably noticed, what I demonstrated here are actually properties of multiplication. They're called uh, associative property and uh, distributive property. We might not use these rigorous terms with children, actually. We don't want to scare them. But when they do the questions like that, they get very, in a very, very natural way, very gently introduced to these important laws of arithmetic. That's what I mean when I say that this is one feature of our tasks. Another feature is that a single mathematical idea uh, can be presented to children in, in a variety of ways. So we disguise this under different contexts. We frame it in different ways. And uh, I, I'll show you an example. So let's say question number one is, we have um, balance scales, Some, something like that. And we have a few weights. Uh, let's say something uh, weighing 12, 8, 3, 2, and 1 grams. It could be pebbles, it could be weights, it could be coins, anything. And the question is to balance these weights, these pebbles, on the balance scale. So pretty simple arithmetic question. That's one way of asking about that. Second way is we can set it up as a puzzle. 12, 8, 3, 2, 1 equals 0. And ask children to put pluses and minuses in between the numbers so that the sum is correct. Well, this is essentially the same task. But whether they recognize it or not, we don't know yet. And when they see that it's essentially the same task, they learn to see through the insignificant details of the uh, question itself, and they, they just look for a deeper meaning. Or we can present it in a different way. Let's say we have a grasshopper who moves strictly along the straight line. So it starts here and has five jumps to do. And you probably can guess what the jumps are. The jumps are of 12 centimeters, not meters, yeah, that's too much. 8 centimeters, 3 centimeters, 2 centimeters, and 1 centimeter. And the question is, can the grasshopper, after making these two five jumps in any order, return to the point it started? So essentially, all these questions are about the, the balance. Balancing um, numbers, balancing left and right, balancing addition and, multi and subtraction. Just seeing this sequence, children learn better about the relationship between addition and subtraction, and they see multiple uses of the same uh, concept. We can, we can set them up uh, just in a row, one after another, if we want to stress the importance of a new concept we introduce. Or we can spread them, the questions like that 
over a period of time so that we can use them as a revision tool. And uh, the third and probably most important feature of uh, the tasks we use is that we always try to introduce ch children to some general principles of mathematical thinking. So what does it mean? Let's say we come across a strange pattern. 10 times 10. Everyone knows it's 100. But if you do 9 times 11, this is just 99. So the answers are close to each other. The questions seem pretty similar. What is it? Is, is it just a coincidence that if we shift away from 10 in both numbers, one, one, one number goes down, the other goes up. The answer is low. It's lower than before, but just by one. Let's check something else. 7 times 7, 49. The next question we should ask ourselves, let's check what is 6 times 8. Well, it is 48. And once again, we notice the same pattern works. And then if we are really brave, we can go move to something like 30 times 30, 900. And then we can check whether 29 times 31 is indeed 899. So when we come across like that, across um, examples like that, we ask children, well, first of all, to check whether it's a genuine pattern or not. Um, well, probably after 10 or more examples of of the same, they will say, yes, it does work. But sometimes it, it still doesn't. And we'll come across examples like that as well. But if they are more or less convinced that it does work for any combination of numbers, then the next question, can you prove it? Can you convince that it will work uh, for whatever numbers I choose? They can be as high or as low as I, as I, as I like. Or maybe there is an alternative opinion that this might not work for some numbers and give me a counterexample, or maybe a series of counterexamples. Maybe they follow a different pattern, then we need to know about that as well. So uh, this approach, when we not just uh, do calculations and move on, but we actually explore what's going on. We start noticing patterns, we investigate them, we see whether it's a genuine pattern or just a coincidence. We try to, to prove it, if possible. And uh, by the way, the proper way to describe what this pattern is, the most compact way, is to use algebra. So children are, again, reduced to algebra in, in a way that uh, not imposing because they need it. Once they struggle to describe the pattern in words, you can imagine how many words it takes. Um, they, they accept that, well, using variables and letters for, for numbers would be much better. So uh, that's what I mean when I say that uh, we explore different ways of thinking mathematically. Uh, these are all uh, this generalization, investigation, looking for multiple solutions. They are all essential and very powerful tools in mathematics. And we try to make sure that every student um, is able to keep up and expand their own thinking toolbox. So I probably should mention the elephant in the room, which is 11 plus exams. In two or three years, uh, your children will see 11 plus. And the purpose of the exam is to check for understanding of mathematics. But the only way to check it is to ask students to solve some problems. So it's very tempting to, to, to do some kind of a shortcut. And uh, the most common way of preparation is to do as many practice <coughs> papers as possible in the hope that on the day the child will pick it up quickly and uh, passes the test. 
And doing practice papers really helps, but mostly with uh, recognizing different types of questions and memorizing methods for their solution. Uh, it, it re on its own, it really uh, helps with understanding. And uh, I can even tell you that in the last few years, I had a few requests from parents whose children already passed the 11 plus, who were accepted to the school they wanted to go. But they said, by the day the acceptance letter arrives, the children forget everything. They don't, they, they seem as if their mind goes blank because the stress is out, the repeated practice is not there anymore, and without firm foundation of proper understanding, all these details of techniques and methods just slip away. That's natural for, for memory. That's how it works. That's why parents ask for tutoring, for real preparation for the next year, next school year. So I would say if you want to learn a foreign language, it would be useless if you just copy words from a dictionary again and again. So the best way to learn the language is to get immersed in it, to watch movies, sing songs, just read newspapers and books, speak to natives, talk to na native speakers. And in the same way, uh, the best way to learn mathematics is to get immersed in it. And that's what we do in our lessons. In September, I asked children whether they like math. In my first lesson, I asked them that. And most of them categorically say no. I, <laughs> I, I, I can't say I was disappointed, mm -hmm. because that's, that's mostly what I expected. Uh, but, and I don't uh, expect them to uh, have changed their minds so quickly. But I'm absolutely sure that this will happen. Because I can see the changes. They might seem slight and insignificant, but I know how important they are. Um, they seem more independent when they deal with questions. They start asking themselves what if questions. They share their thinking and judge each other uh, according to the whether the person is con uh, convincing or not. And uh, the most uh, wonderful thing is that they've already had some memorable aha moments when they feel this pleasure of reaching some level of understanding they haven't been at before. So I'm absolutely certain that your children are on the way to success whether in formal tests or in the wider picture of just understanding of mathematics in general. Thank you very much for listening to me.